Hello, this is Doug Gerlach from iClub Central. Welcome to our Investment Club webinar. Today is August 17th, 2021. And in this edition of our monthly Investment Club webinar, we're gonna be taking a look at the annual tasks that an Investment Club treasurer should be prepared to undertake on behalf of his or her Investment Club. Joining me tonight will be uh, Russell Malley, our Club Accounting Advisor and Sean Polrang, our Senior Technical uh, technical Support Representative. Uh, they're both in the back office and they may answer questions if you have them, as well as pop in with some additional commentary as we go. There is a PDF handout of the slides of our presentation, so you can grab that from the Handouts tab in the GoToWebinar application. Uh, and when we archive it, we'll include a link in the webinar description uh, that you can also grab it if you don't get a copy tonight. The Club Treasurer Task Series that we put together, we grouped the tasks into three categories. The monthly tasks, those tasks that are undertaken each month before and after the meeting. The annual tasks treasurers should be prepared to undertake, uh, including things like um, withdrawing partners, adding members, and uh, uh, accounting for particular security transactions, and then finally, annual tasks. And so uh, we've covered those monthly and occasional tasks in past webinars, and tonight we're gonna take a look at the annual tasks as we head into the end of the calendar year. Uh, you'll be gearing up for uh, many of the tasks that we're going to be talking about tonight. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the questions box and type them in as we go. And we're going to start off right away with some of the big annual tasks that treasurers undertake, which is closing the books at year end. Closing the books in our nomenclature is a series of steps that we suggest the treasurers do to make sure that their books are accurate, that all transactions have been entered, and that they're ready for the preparation of the club's uh, annual tax returns. Uh, it, we don't actually close the books in terms of, in accounting terms so much uh, because of the ongoing connected nature of all of the unit value transactions that uh, are utilized in investment club accounting. Uh, it's not quite the same as in traditional accounting, but we still uh, cover these in an annual webinar uh, and that's really key for, as something for you to keep in mind every year in December, and we've been doing it for something like 15 years or longer, we host a Closing the Books webinar. Since many of these tasks are under only undertaken on an annual basis uh, and there are changes in partnership law and the software that we use at MyiClub, uh, it's a good idea to put it on your calendar to uh, attend the annual presentation of our Closing the Books webinars. Um, and especially if you're a new treasurer, this is one of those, those must-attend webinars that will really position you well for the preparation of the club's tax returns and making sure that your books are accurate. Uh, we record the webinar, but it's also presented live, so you can come in with questions if you have them, and we'll publish it on our YouTube channel afterwards as we do all of our webinar videos. If you'd like to, you can check the learning tab on iClub.com for the schedule of our club webinars. Uh, the December 2021 webinar will be on the third uh, Tuesday month as we uh, our series here. Uh, so Tuesday 21st. So that this year the presentation it's already scheduled uh, we're going to touch on some of the tasks that are undertaken as part of the using the books uh closing the books uh a procedure tonight we're not going to go a lot of deep because we're going to be covering uh, most of that information in depth in december but you should be prepared to to do first and foremost uh, Time at the end to make sure that all of your accounts are reconciled. Your financial, your brokerage account, your bank account are reconciled with your club accounting transaction. So everything's entered and everything is act and the balances match from the, the accounts to your. If you do this on a monthly or uh, other regular basis, it should be pretty forward to make sure that your books are accurate. Uh, and when you're 
processing transactions at year end, it's very, very, very important that you keep the last day of the year clear. You have no transactions on December 31st of any year. We're going to treat that as a special date. We're going to allocate, divide up all the club's income and expenses as of that date. And some types of transactions in combination with others can often throw off that allocation uh, process. So we like to keep it clear. Uh, the program will warn you not to enter a transaction on December 31st, and that's the reason for it. So we'll suggest that you move anything that actually happens on the 31st to December 30th. Uh, put a note in the transaction notes if you'd like to make sure that uh, to help uh, remind you what that uh, what the date actually was. Uh, and then also, if you have an ETF or mutual fund uh, or other security that might pay a dividend uh, early in January, but specifically says that dividend is taxable in the prior tax year, uh, you need to enter that not on January 3rd or 5th, but enter that on December 30th as well. So it gets included in the taxable transactions for uh, the prior tax year. So this is a pretty important step, something that you should undertake uh, again it would be great if you uh, could endeavor on a monthly basis to make sure the balances match, um, that your cash matches in all of your different accounts uh, and your books, uh, but uh, take an extra few moments at year end to make sure that everything is entered correctly. And then, as I mentioned, you're going to do this once a year. You're going to allocate the club's income and expenses to the partners. Now, a partnership is considered by the IRS as a ta pass-through tax entity. That means that the partnership itself doesn't have to pay any taxes on its income, that the partners are responsible individually for their share of the tax liability of the partnership. So the pr procedure for transferring that liability is uh, included as part of the allocation of income and expenses. So once you're confident that your the books have been uh, that all the books are accurate for the year, that you've received your tax documents, uh, go to the accounting utilities section and then select allocate income and expenses. All you have to do is select the year. So select uh, this year, you'll select 2021, and uh, that's it. Click the button, and uh, you will. Uh, the program will allocate every member their share of the taxable gains, the income, the losses, the expenses uh, for the year. And we do this on a, on a time basis uh, so that every, we, we don't uh, just simply add up everything at the end of the year and allocate it according to who owned what at the end of the year, how much of the partnership uh, members owned at the end of the year. Uh, we look at each transaction, each income and expense uh, or gains transaction, and then we divide that uh, amount uh, uh, to the members at that point in time and their uh, their percentage ownership. And then we tally everything up at the end of the year. This is much fairer. And this is uh, then the old days when we had to do it manually. If you had a big change of ownership from the beginning of the year to the end of the year or in the middle of the year, uh, you had a partner who withdrew uh, a significant amount of capital or added a significant amount of capital, the year-end allocation wouldn't be quite so fair. So this is, again, another advantage of software uh, that you get a much fairer distribution of all of the club's income and expenses at year-end through this process. Now, the allocation process, really, it just sets aside uh, or, or separates all of the different types of income and expenses um, and assigns each member their share according to that the formula that I just discussed. But you can do it as many times as possible. So if you go back and change a transaction, you find an error in a transaction in July, you can correct it and then redo the allocation. And you can do that as often as possible prior to the preparation of your tax returns. And this is required as part of that tax return process. As I mentioned, this is what the IRS expects from partnerships, that you're gonna divide up all of the income and expenses and pass it through to the partners. Uh, the Allocation report looks something like this across the top. You'll see all of the different types of income and expense and gain and loss uh, and other distributions, including you know qualifying and non-qualifying 
qualifying dividends, interest, tax-free interest, short-term capital gains, long-term capital gains, other income, investment expenses, non-investment expenses, foreign taxes that might have been withheld, charity, charitable contributions, and then the total at the end. And you can see sometimes the, the total might be positive, other times it might be negative depending on the uh, the members, when they were owners, uh, how much they had invested at a per particular point of time in the club. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, instead of capital gains, you have capital losses, um, these amounts could be negative. You're pa passing through uh, the capital losses. But each of these different items gets reported on the individual's uh, personal tax return. You'll notice at the top there is a withdrawal so this was a member who withdrew at the end of January. So they got very little of the um, uh, a, a small amount of uh, capital losses that were distributed to them from a transaction that happened earlier in the year. Uh, and then they appear again at the remaining members. It was only a partial withdrawal. Uh, and then they get a, a much uh, a much different uh, amount of uh, each of those. Uh, income and expense items. So this is really uh, key to understand uh, that everything, it's, you can't just take the total at the far right uh, of gains and losses. Uh, each of these individual items then would go on your personal return as interest or dividends or capital gains or losses. Um, and it, this report can be shared to your members, should be shared, and they can utilize this to begin working on their personal tax return. At least it will give them an idea of how much uh, they might need to uh, be paying taxes on. Uh, you know, in one case here, uh, you can see Atlantis here has $1,000 of allocated income uh, and uh, capital gains. So that's a significant tax liability. Um, but other members might have a couple hundred dollars. Uh, so it really varies. Now, one thing that you might run into if you own what we call problem securities, which are things like real estate investment trusts, ETFs, uh, mutual funds, um, or other securities, uh, such as MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships, Royalty Trusts, uh, anything that is not a common stock uh, may make distributions, um, uh, aka dividends, that include items that are not dividends, such as capital gains or uh, um, in the case of real estate investment trust, something called unrecaptured section 1250 gains, uh, or they may pay non-qualifying dividends and a certain amount of it has been designated as a qualifying dividend. So if you have marked any of these problem securities as other, you're gonna get a little window that says uh, if there's any qualifying dividends or unrecaptured section 1250 gains for these securities, enter those amounts here. Usually these are going to be uh, reported in January. Uh, you won't know when you receive these distributions, the particular makeup of those distributions. Uh, it's only at the end of the year, after the year, the new year starts, the companies uh, typically calculate and share with shareholders uh, the dis the disposition of all of those distributions that you receive, in which case you've got to go back and edit them all. And uh, for the certain types of uh, securities, security transactions, you will have values that you will need to enter uh, as part of the allocation process. So again, we call them problem securities. We wish clubs would sort of stay away from them. Uh, they complicate things rather unnecessarily, uh, but that's part of that allocation process. Uh, if we, if you don't know, and if we don't know what the correct disposition of your distributions that you receive from securities, um, then you can't prepare an accurate tax return. So you've got to wait for those values uh, or figure them out as you go through. Uh, Bonnie uh, wants to kind of walk through the uh, withdrawal distribution. So uh, you can see, let me grab my pen over here. Uh, so uh, Atlantis uh, withdrew uh, on uh, a partial partial withdrawal. She made a withdrawal from the club on January 30th, 2020. Um, uh, so this is last January. This is the 2020 um, oh, uh, allocation uh, in, in, income allocation of income and expense report for the club. So she withdrew a portion, just a partial withdrawal on January 30th. You can see here that the only transaction that was uh, allocated to her 
as of that date was a capital loss that happened. So the club obviously in January sold a stock, incurred a capital loss. Her share of the loss from the amount of her withdrawal was $29.12, right? And so she had, there were no other transactions early, that early in the year. There was no interest. There were no other dividends that were paid. So th that this is the withdrawal portion of her, of her, um, uh, the money that was, she withdrew from the club, this is her portion of the income and expense allocation for that. Now she appears down here because she remained in the club. So this is the bulk of her um, income and expense allocation. So she has uh, non-qualifying dividends, qualifying dividends, short-term and long-term capital gains, other income, uh, investment expenses, foreign taxes withheld uh, that she will need to worry about on her personal tax return. So uh, though that's why she shows up in uh, in uh, two uh, two categories here as a withdrawal distribution during the year and then as part of the year-end distribution. Uh, if you have uh, the withdrawal distributions, again, could be uh, for partial withdrawals or for full withdrawals. Uh, and uh, there is a <clears throat> there is um, uh, a tiny, tiny, uh, uh, tiny footnote. If you make a partial withdrawal during the year, uh, you need to wait until year end to get the accurate distribution. Uh, of uh, allocation of income and expenses because things might get reclassified if you have those problem securities. Uh, so the withdrawal report has more details on that, but uh, that's the uh, uh, what we're looking at right here on the allocation of income and expenses. So again, this report you can give to your your, your club members and uh, they can give it to their accountant or tax prep uh, representative. Uh, yeah, hi Russell. I just wanted to add, um on the actual, when you file the taxes on the K-1, these two amounts uh, will be uh, combined. They won't be show separately. Right. Yep, you're gonna. We'll talk more about the K-1 that that your uh, members are gonna receive uh, as well, and uh, so those amounts will all get totaled together. But uh, this is just uh, again, the details are here for anybody who wants to know uh, how it works. Uh, another step at year end is the audit of your club's books that you need to uh, that you need to conduct that we suggest that you conduct uh, and to assist in that we provide a an investment club audit uh, checklist uh, to help you run your annual audit it describes the information that uh, the treasurer could should collect and give to the audit committee and you'll find it in your club's my iClub file storage library. It's in the one of the PDF resources there. Uh, so uh, it's got the form that you your committee can use to validate their audit uh, and submit it for the club's records. <clears throat> if you do purchase the Fidelity Bond Insurance from Better Investing, uh, this is required to be undertaken each year. Uh, and be part of the club's permanent records. Uh, again, we'll cover the audit in more detail at year end, but uh, be prepared um, to convene an audit committee of club members. The treasurer is not a member of the committee, uh, but the treasurer may make his or herself available to the committee to answer questions. The treasurer provides reports, statements, confirmations of transactions, details uh, of uh, the all of the club's activity uh, in the course of the calendar year. The committee then takes that information and compares the information that's been entered in the books uh, to the information that's been that's included on the financial statements, for instance. Uh, and there are a couple of different ways that you can undertake an audit. You can you can do a complete audit of every transaction for the entire year, uh, which might could could number you know in the several hundreds uh, or even thousands of transactions. Um, you might select uh, four or five random months of the year and do every transaction within a particular month. Uh, if you're distributed, uh, an online club, you can distribute tasks. You can have one member review all the distribution transactions, one member review all the member transactions, one member review all the security transactions, for instance, and, and split up the work. So there are a lot of ways that you can do it. Uh, if you don't find any problems, um, that's great. You can sign the statement and be done with it. Uh, 
the committee can also make recommendations if they see that um, checks were, were held for too long before being deposited or uh, if there seem to be other ways that things could be improved, they could certainly make those, uh, make those recommendations. One of the great things about the audit from the treasurer's perspective is that it helps other members understand the treasurer's job. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, no treasurer, there are treasurers, and I see a couple of you out here who've been appointed treasurer for life uh, if, for your investment club, but often clubs like to rotate that treasurer position. And this is a great way to get members to kind of understand the process of club accounting and what's involved. Uh, and so I like that aspect of it as well. Investment clubs and investing partnerships should be run on a transparent basis uh, where members should have access, should be, there should be no secret transactions or hidden transactions or information that's withheld from the members of the partnership. Uh, and so this is one way that you can make sure that all of those lines of communication and uh, uh, the, the, the trail of the audit trail of transactions uh, remains intact. So uh, after the end of the year and after you've audited your books, uh, the next task that you undertake on an annual basis, uh, it's a pretty big one. It's submitting, preparing and submitting the club's federal and if required, state tax returns. And again, this is a, a big topic. We host a webinar in January every year preparing the club taxes. Um, tax laws change frequently. So we recommend that you, you, you show up every year so you make sure that you understand any changes, what's new, what's different, uh, what's changed since the last year. Uh, and uh, not only does tax law change, but we make improvements to the software, uh, to the the tax preparation software that can help you out here. Uh, if you are an experienced treasurer, this is a good refresher. If you're a new treasurer, it's a, again, something you really should make an effort to attend. Uh, and again, we archive these, uh, but again, I wouldn't recommend watching last year's webinar to help you prepare for this year's tax preparation because things may change. Uh, we might have uh, some different recommendations, different, uh, uh, the software may work slightly different and may be improved. Uh, but we do record the webinar, so if you can at attend that live session on the third uh, Tuesday in January, uh, we will record it and publish it on our YouTube channel. Um, and again, the learning tab on iClub.com has the schedule there so you can find it. Uh, and in the last several years, we have been uh, doing a tax clinic webinar on the third uh, Tuesday of February, uh, where it's an open Q&A format where you get to come to the webinar, bring your problems, bring your questions, things that didn't work, uh, and then we can we can tackle them at the at the um, uh, at that point. If there are some common problems that have been popping up, uh, we can uh, present uh, how to work through those particular issues. Uh, the deadline you'll see we'll talk about it in a minute. The deadline for getting your your 1099s from your bank and broker is February 15th. So by that third Tuesday, you should have all the information and it's just a good refresher. You should be stepping through, practicing, uh, doing a trial run of the tax printer software. Uh, and then if you do run into glitches, that's a good time to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to show up at that webinar and uh, see if you can get some answers for you. The, IRS requires that investing partnerships file each year and every year. The deadline is March 15th. It is not April 15th. Investing partnerships must file by March 15th. Uh, and so this was changed several years ago. Uh, if you're new to investment clubs and investment club accounting uh, and tax preparation, uh, make sure that you, 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 you mark that date down. Uh, you don't want to be late. There are no exemptions from filing that IRS Form 1065 and related schedules. Uh, there, there are no circumstances in which an investing partnership um, like a Better Investing Style Investment Club uh, 
can not file that annual return. And the IRS will levy penalties for late or missed filings. Uh, and those penalties can be substantial. So uh, we, we recommend that you make sure that you file uh, and file on a timely basis. Um, if, uh, and you can request uh, an extension. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now we make a separate uh, Club Federal Tax Printer program uh, each year. Uh, and a separate purchase because we have to uh, develop it each year. We are an approved e-filer with the IRS, so we go through a process with the IRS that it allows us to e-file um, club returns, uh, which is less expensive than mailing them. Uh, you get a guaranteed confirmation number. It's been working out great, uh, but still a lot of clubs are still printing on paper and doing it the old fashioned way. Uh, and that's when things get lost in the mail and when you've got to go around. Uh, but when you e-file, you get that confirmation number. That's the, uh, the proof that the IRS received your return. Uh, last year, uh, March 15th is the deadline. Last year, uh, uh, individuals got a, an extension because of the COVID-19. So um, there was a three-month, uh, I believe, March, April, May, June, yeah, July, to July, there was a three-month extension on personal returns, but that did not impact partnership returns. So uh, at clubs that might have thought, oh, well, I've got a three-month uh, extension for my club return, that turned out not to be the case. Um, so that March 15th deadline is pretty solid. The only time that it changes is, is if March 15th ends up on a Sunday, then uh, the deadline could get moved to March 16th. Uh, but still work to that March 15th deadline um, and put that on your calendar. Now, many states require a state return, but not all. Um, so uh, roughly half of the states in the United States currently, according to our best understanding of each state's laws, uh, require clubs, uh, to, um, uh, clubs to file a return. Of those 25, we provide Club, uh, state tax form support for 15 states. So there are, that leaves about 10 states uh, that tend to be very small states um, like Vermont or uh, West Virginia or Connecticut that do have a requirement that we are unable to support. Uh, but uh, uh, so make sure you can check if you're on the list at uh, iClub.com. And we do, we will cover this in our webinar. Um, the tax prep webinar, we will cover what we believe is the case for individual states and their current requirements for partnerships to file a tax return with the state. Um, and because it does change, st uh, there have been states that used to require partnerships to file and no longer. Um, and other states are looking to collect more revenue and looking to open up to more filing. Uh, and there are some states that require investing partnerships to file, but specifically exempt investment clubs. So it gets to be a little complicated, but we, we'll give you some guidance on that. Now, another wrinkle, uh, there are about eight states that require tax returns from non-resident uh, states with resident partners. So what that means is uh, if you live live in a state um, uh, that, uh, but your club is in another state, uh, it could be that your state requires your club to file because you're a partner in that state, even though the, the partnership is officially headquartered in another state. So as I said, there are about eight states that require that now. Um, and again, we have a list of those current states that you can uh, that you can review uh, the uh, and again we have documentation on, on our iclub.com website in the taxes tab that you can uh, that you can check it out uh, and uh, review it that way uh, and we'll, where you'll find the guidance uh, and uh, what we believe to be uh, the current requirements for those different states. And so again, that club state tax printer is a separate uh, separate e-file, a uh, separate module for filing. Uh, and we also support e-filing for 
uh, I think we're working our way up to eight states this year uh, for e-filing in those states. In most of those states, we don't support paper forms for any longer. So they, uh, because states are requiring e-filing uh, and so uh, we're unable to generate paper forms for those uh, for clubs in those states. Um, Jay asks if your club doesn't want to put social security numbers online, uh, how do you handle it? Well, there's no way to e-file without inputting the uh, club's social security numbers into the tax forms. Uh, if you don't want to store them online, the treasurer can input them at the time the tax forms are prepared. Uh, but again, there's no way to prevent them from being, quote, online, uh, even though they are encrypted and not in files uh, on a server somewhere, they're still in a database uh, that we, uh, that is uh, according to our, our data security and privacy principles. Uh, for most, most people realize that your social security number is already online and it's already been discovered. And so uh, that may be a particularly jaded view, but it's not necessarily the, the high security, uh, high security, high level of security requirement that many people uh, tend to, used to believe that it was. Uh, and certainly the IRS uh, supports uh, uh, e-filing uh, and the requirements are you've got to have a social security number so somehow that information has to be transmitted all right um, one of the other tasks that is a part of the tax preparation process that you will uh, be undertaking as treasurer is providing the partners with their own schedule K-1 that lists all the transactions. Again, it's the amounts that were shown on that allocation report, but it's in the, K, the IRS K-1 format, uh, and those partners are required to get that by March 15th. Um, and the idea is that uh, the partnership provides that K-1 to partners by March 15th, and that allows the individuals to use that K-1 in their personal return, which is filed by April 15th. Uh, so if you have partners who have withdrawals in the year, they also need their withdrawal report uh, because there's information uh, on the withdrawal report that is not included in the K-1. Uh, so again, we'll, re we'll uh, remind you about that at year end as well. Members in your club should not expect uh, the K-1 until the club has received all of its Form 1099s, which are by law uh, supposed to arrive by federal uh, or be, uh, be mailed by February 15th. So you can see here that if you're the treasurer, you might not have all the relevant information by February until February 15th. You have a March 15th deadline. Your members are, are saying, when are we going to get our K-1? I want to do my personal taxes. Uh, so you've got to be, uh, you've got to be uh, organized at year end uh, and uh, well prepared so that you can service all of the needs of your partners uh, and the demands of your federal and state government. Um, I should also point out that the states uh, may have a March 15th deadline. Some of them have other deadlines such as April 15th. They they're might still be using the April 15th deadline. Uh, so don't uh, assume one way or the other, you need to confirm with each state. Uh, so in terms of that calendar, again, time is going to be tight. If you get all of your 1099 sometime around February 15th, uh, and many brokers uh, are historically very late in delivering 1099s. They have to pay a penalty to the IRS if they are late, but many of them would rather pay the penalty than be timely. Uh, and so customers end up not getting their K-1s until late in February. Uh, and that can really make it tough for uh, meeting that March 15th deadline. Another problem, if you have problem securities like MLPs or royalty trusts that, that issue themselves issue K-1, so they're issuing a K-1 to your club, that K-1 doesn't have to arrive until March 15th. Now, many of them are pretty good about delivering those K-1s uh, in February, but uh, there's nothing saying it couldn't come uh, sometime early in March. Uh, and again, that would be 
uh, would put you in a bind if you're trying to meet that March 15th deadline and you don't have the K-1 from uh, one of the securities that the club owns. Again, that's why we call them problem securities. Uh, uh, we suggest that you collect all those year-end statements and 1099s, make sure you've got them in a safe place. Uh, my uh, practice is as I receive them online or receive emails about them, that I print them out and put them in a folder. That just seems to make it organized for me. It's already there. Uh, I have a tax folder and everything goes into it as it arrives and I don't have to worry about trying to track it down later. Uh, and then follow those closing the books year end procedures. Make sure that your club understands that that uh, the tax calendar uh, and that if they're one of those people who loves to get their uh, refund and uh, so files at the, be er, at the beginning of February, as part of an investment club, that's often not possible. The, we release our club tax printers in January or February for the IRS and for supported states. We phase them out as we get approval from the various states. Um, and we suggest that you don't wait until March 14th to generate your return, especially if you're a first time user. Um, Chances are you're going to have questions, you're going to run into it, you might have a transaction that isn't entered correctly or a security that isn't typed correctly uh, and uh, things aren't matching what the your, what your broker reported to the IRS. So if you're doing that on March 14th and you're one of those uh, bands of people who are ca frantically calling our office, uh, you might have a tough time uh, getting it resolved. So we want you to... to, to uh, uh, work on your taxes earlier, uh, and most of our clubs are pretty much done before the end of February, and that will give you enough time to address any problems. As you can imagine, it's a busy time for our support team, uh, and so we really uh, want you to get an early start so that we can make sure that we're, we're, uh, we've got the resources to assist you. If you think it's going to be a problem with you meeting that March 15th deadline, you can request an automatic extension of the IRS filing deadline if you need to. So there's a form that will provide that will link to um, complete that form, uh, send it off to the IRS, and again, make sure you get proof of uh, proof of mailing with that. And then uh, even if you're filing on March 16th, if you're e-filing on March 17th, um, that's fine. Uh, if you request the extension and you're able to file on March 13th, that's great. It didn't, it didn't uh, hurt you in any way. Uh, the IRS doesn't care. But if you don't file, request that extension and you're late, then you're going to start triggering uh, late fees and the IRS will come after you uh, for missing that March 15th deadline. So. Uh, keep that in mind if you're if you're feeling up against it in February, March, and you're really concerned that that March 15 deadline might be tough uh, to meet. Then you can request that automatic uh, filing. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. I Russell. just wanted to say if you do get a message from the IRS that you're being hit with a late filing penalty, please contact support. We've been pretty good at devising letters to go to the IRS and get those abated. Yep, uh, that's a, a great point. Uh, you know, we can't we can't do miracles, uh, but uh, the minute you have, uh, uh, if, if you're using our software and our tax uh, module, the minute the IRS comes back and has a question, um, you should get in touch with us right away and we will uh, do our best to try to give you some guidance based on what's worked for other clubs uh, and uh, help you help you mitigate that. Um, you know, we've had all sorts of situations. Sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. Uh, but if you um, uh, but if you contact us ahead of time, you've got a better chance of you know, we'll, we'll we'll give you the language um, to use, the letter to use, who to call, you know, what number to call, what to tell them, um, what to put in the letter. Um, you know, we have, we've been doing this for 20 years, so there's a lot of institutional knowledge about investing partnerships and uh, the, the 1065 for investment clubs. And when you think about it, most people at the IRS, this is, you know, the number of investment club returns relative to every other uh, partnership that uses 1065 is very small. Uh, and uh, when you look at 
professional tax preparers and CPAs and accountants and bookkeepers uh, who are handling investment clubs, the number is very small. Um, we handle thousands of club tax returns uh, that we help uh, clubs to file and uh, do their books. So uh, we know often better than the average IRS rep might know uh, about particular types of transactions or why things are coded the way that they are. So, um, uh, but thanks for reminding us, Russell. That's a that's a great uh, that's a great value add to your annual subscription to the iClub and my iClub tools. Uh, Year-end is a great time as well to take care of a couple of other tasks. Uh, one is your to re review your backup procedures. Uh, our My iClub backup uh, our My iClub server is backed up continuously. So we've got you know the RAID array that that uh, so if a, 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 a disk drive fails, there's another one right there that's got the identical information on it, uh, and so we can um, uh, we can you know replace drives and we can make sure that the server is backed up on a continuous basis. But this doesn't mean that if your club gets messed up because the you know you have fat fingers on the keyboard or um, your, uh, your, you know, your toddler grandchild sat down at the computer and started banging keys. It doesn't mean that we can restore your club. It means we can restore all clubs as of a particular point in time. So we're not able to restore uh, a problem that you caused in your investment club. And that's why we have something called the backup manager, which allows you to create online backups, uh, create backups and store them online in your My iClub account. And those protect you from your mistakes, not from acts of God or technological problems uh, that we're engineered to help uh, mitigate. So this is uh, we're gonna this is something that you should be doing on a regular basis. Um, we, if you neglect making your your online backups, we'll do it uh, every 90 days for you. Uh, but we suggest that you get in the habit of checking those backups and making sure that they are there and occasionally downloading them. In the accounting utilities, there is the backup manager. It's the tool that you use to create online backups of your club data. Um, you can use it at any point in time. One of the best use cases for this is if you've got a complicated merger or spin-off transaction with cash and dividends and ticker symbol changes, and you get um, um, and you, you've got the instructions that Russell's created for how to enter it, and it's a dozen steps long, and you're like, boy, I would hate to mess this up. And the minute you think about that, you have that thought, then uh, everything is gonna, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're gonna, you're gonna mistype something, you're gonna transpose some digits, you're going to click the wrong button. Um, so before those types of complicated transactions, or maybe it's your first withdrawal with stock and you're unsure about it, go to the backup manager, make a backup right now. Then do your problem, tra try that, that transaction that you were worried about. If it goes okay, that's great. You don't have to do anymore. If you go in and you start going down a rabbit hole and you start trying to undo and back up, before you know it, things are going to get messy. So stop, go back to the backup manager, restore. It takes you back in time. It's like a little time machine that takes you back in time. So this is a really great feature here. If you click on it, um, you'll see here uh, there's a item to make a backup. And then in this club, you can see the dates and times of all the different backups. You can click on one of those links and download that file to your computer to save it. Um, and there's a recover button over on the on the uh, right side. So you can see this, this club has backups going back to 2004. Um, you don't need all those old backups are probably not necessary. Uh, but uh, just to, to, it doesn't count towards your file storage space. So uh, again, you don't need to do it every week, every day. The question is, if you had a catastrophic problem, uh, how much data might would you be willing to re-enter? Would you think, well, that's an inconvenience, but it's not the end of the world? You know, could you go back for the last three months and enter all the member deposits and buys and sells and dividends? For most people in an investment club, that's not the end of the world. If you have to go back for a year and a half and enter all those transactions, now we're talking about something that's much uh, much uh, going to take a lot more time. It's 
going to be a lot harder to make sure that everything is accurate. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's why we suggest, every, you know, we automatically will do this for you every 90 days. Uh, but um, keep in mind your own uh, preferences. Uh, and get familiar with that backup manager. And certainly we suggest at year end, once everything's been entered correctly, um, this is a good time to make a year end backup uh, so that you know that everything is solid as of December 31st or, or January 1st of the particular year. Now you can also download that backup by clicking on a link. You can also export uh, the uh, uh, that download file. And again, backup protocol, uh, in order to be successful, requires redundancy so that you've got your backup stored online. Um, you've got another backup on a flash drive uh, that, that's stored in your safety deposit box or a fireproof safe at your house, um, or that you put it in an envelope and take to your office, uh, for those of you who might might still be going to offices and put it in a desk drawer there so that it's away from your house. If you have a backup file of your, compu of your computer that's sitting next to your computer, doesn't help you if you've got a flood in your house, right? Your backup is now destroyed along with your computer. So you wanna get it off out of, out of, the, uh, out of the way. So uh, whether it's a USB flash drive, uh, Russell's favorite tip is he emails the uh, the file to himself using his Google, his Gmail account. Um, and then he just puts it, he archives the message um, so he can find it if he needs to. And uh, it's been, now it's up in the cloud. If you're using a cloud backup, you can store a copy there. And again, this is again, not something you need to do every month, but once a year, it's a good idea to have that, uh, that backup uh, that is, um, uh, that is there for your protection. So again, uh, not uh, to protect against uh, the server crashing, but against making making a mistake, uh, accidentally uh, hitting the button that says delete all club data. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. And then uh, uh, we delete all your club data, and uh, uh, you know people just uh, kind of have that 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 moment of where they're thinking one thing, they're reading something else and uh, don't get the message. So this this will protect you from that particular problem. So in the accounting utilities, scroll down to the export accounting records, um, click the button, uh, it'll pop open your browser, say, what do you wanna do with it? Uh, you're just gonna save it to your computer, it's not gonna work with any other program, but if you need to come back to my iClub at any time, you can upload that file. Again, it's very, very exceptionally rare that we have, um, uh, that clubs have problems with their club data that requires a complete wipeout and upload of data from an external data or even from uh, the backup manager. We do, people do use the backup manager um, uh, as I discussed, if, you know, experienced treasurers who go, yeah, let me just, let me just try it, try this transaction, make sure that I get it right and the, use the backup manager in that way. And that happens all the time and that's great. Um, but, um, uh, but it's very rare, but again, uh, it's like insurance, uh, you know, you hate to ever, you, you hate to pay for it. You hate to do it, uh, write the check, but when you need it, it's great to have. So yeah, it takes a couple minutes to do these exports, but part, put it in, in your routine, at least do it once a year, and that will just offer that additional protection if something does go wrong. Uh, something else to think about in uh, many clubs kind of take the year, uh, the end of the year to prepare an annual report that summarizes the club activity, the performance, they take stock in January and say, all right, where did we end uh, last year? Uh, how does the portfolio look? Uh, well, can we use that to set goals for uh, the new year? Uh, what kinds of companies are we gonna, do we need more small companies in our portfolio? Do we need to diversify into some different sectors? Um, do we have some holdings that are potentially overvalued? Um, so take stock of the portfolio there, do a portfolio review, um, prepare the, um, 
prepare some of the portfolio diversification reports, the balance sheet, transaction summaries. Some clubs will come up with kind of put it all together in one PDF with a cover sheet, with a letter from the president and a, a letter, a note from the treasurer and the copy of the audit certification, right? And make it seem like a, a formal annual report um, that's got some of the most important things and accomplishments uh, for the uh, for the club. So that if that might be something that would be a fun project for your club officers uh, at year end. Something that also is best done really no more than once a year is to check your, your uh, club's performance against the overall market. We provide in the report section a simple portfolio gain loss report, which just simply uh, shows you the percentage of gain and loss for each of the securities that you own. But we also have a benchmark report. And benchmarking can sometimes be a little confusing, It's more, but it's more accurate over longer term periods to compare your portfolio performance to the performance of a benchmark, such as a stock market index. Um, and uh, the idea is that we're going to match up all of your club transactions with comparable transactions in and out of a particular index, uh, so, such as the S&P 500. And then we're going to calculate the performance of the index uh, and the performance of your portfolio and compare them. And hopefully over time, your, your club portfolio will perform better than the index. Um, in the short term, because these are annualized figures, um, a, a stock that goes up uh, you know, 10% in a month uh, is extrapolated to you know 120 plus percent over the course of an entire year, and that's just uh, not going to be likely to happen for, it, for many stocks um, because of the way that prices jump up and down in kind of short bursts. So uh, the benchmark report in the short term tends to be less uh, less accurate. Uh, because of that, the the nature of extrapolating and uh, calculating annualized rates of returns. But uh, again, get in the habit uh, after the first couple of years of your club's formation at year end to say, all right, let's see how do we do as of uh, as of this date and time, or maybe if it's not at year end, maybe it's on your club's anniversary date. So that you're really looking at we started on July seventh. Uh, so every year in July, we're going to look at our performance, one year, three year, five years, you know, uh, and uh, for the lifetime of your club. Uh, in the very few clubs in their first two, three, four years uh, are going to be beating the market uh, because you've got expenses, startup expenses. The expenses are high relative to the amount that's invested. You've got the club accounting software, your tax preparation software, better investing memberships, et cetera. So uh, that can really uh, make your returns look less favorable. But that's that that's uh, that's fine. Clubs uh, need to start somewhere. Investors need to start somewhere. Um, so after those first couple of years, then you can start focusing on your performance a little bit more and see is there something we could be doing better uh, by looking at that benchmark and saying, gosh, well, you know, the S&P 500 is uh, is really doing better than our club. Maybe we, there's something we need to look at in terms of our security selection. And having said that. There's, again, nothing wrong with not beating the S&P 500 in your investment club if your focus, perhaps, is more on education. You want your members to get educated. Everyone is learning by doing this. They're taking what they're learning and using it in their personal portfolio. And so uh, not exceeding the broader market averages is not a negative whatsoever. Um, if you're close to it, um, that's a good thing. In any given year, 60% of professional large cap mutual fund managers don't beat the market. So uh, the, if your investment club doesn't uh, and trails it by you know a couple of percentage points, that's pretty good performance. You're doing better than a whole lot of highly compensated mutual fund managers. Um, so you should not worry so much about that. Um, one final tip here is if you are uh, voting in new officers and changing treasurers, we highly recommend that you don't change a treasurer 
at the end of the year, the start of the year. Uh, the tax season uh, and closing the books, that's a very intense time. It's, and that makes it hard for a new treasurer to step in uh, and now be prepared to, to file uh, the club's tax returns. Uh, that can be very complicated. So I think uh, that it'll be much wiser for your club to have treasurers start you know, in April or May or sometime in the middle of the year. So they've got plenty of time to get to gather some experience and knowledge. So when the year end rolls around, when uh, the next tax returns are due, that they've got the opportunity to, um, uh, to handle those with some foundation uh, and understanding about how the unit value system of accounting works uh, and all of the transactions that have happened in the year. So uh, that that would be uh, a final recommendation. Uh, again, that might make, make for some tweaking of when you have your club elections, but I think uh, all in all, uh, it will make that new treasurer, incoming treasurer's job a whole lot easier if they don't get thrown into the deep end right off of the bat. So with that, if you have any additional questions, Russell, Russell and Sean have been busy in the, uh, the, the back office. Um, now, I just wanted to bring up, we had several questions about the uh, states requiring um, returns even if you only have the only association is you have one partner in that residence so i just want to read them out so, so okay. people can, can know them so they these states are georgia missouri new york new jersey oregon pennsylvania west virginia and indiana so if you have a if you're not organized in those states but you have a partner resident in those states you're going to have to file a tax return for those that state and with the uh, with the My Eye Club Club State Tax Printer module, um, you purchase it for one state. Uh, you purchase it once, and then you can print returns for the for multiple states if you need to. Uh, so if you are an online club with members in a lot of different states, you uh, you might need to re to print uh, a number, generate reforms for a number of states, and that's no additional cost. But it does require you to go through the tax preparation process one more time uh, for each of the states that might be relevant there. Yeah, so uh, that's that's great. Thank you for uh, for bringing that up. Uh, those those states do ch tend to change over time, but hopefully that will um, that will uh, uh, be pretty 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 static for the current tax season. Um, and uh, uh, again, it's pretty it's once you've done your returns for one state, doing it for another state tends to be pretty straightforward. So it's not a big uh, 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 require a lot of additional time and effort on your part. Uh, and for many of the states, we also are supporting e-filing now. Uh, so that facilitates things a little bit. Um, so there's no printing and mailing uh, required for those states. Well, with that, uh, I will wrap it up. I will thank you for turning out for this presentation. We'll look forward to seeing you. Uh, so we've got our September, October, and November uh, club webinars coming up. We'll probably talk about portfolio uh, portfolio management. Uh, one of them. Uh, we'll talk about maybe stock selection and uh, uh, some other uh, club operation issues. But if you do have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to email me there at gerlock at iclub.com. We'll do our best to address them in a future presentation. Thanks again, Russell and Sean, and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next investment club webinar.